Artificial Intelligence, a fan's novel. Book Two, Chapter Two. Mecca. The night was arriving quickly. The scattered beams of light that broke through the overhang of trees and vines slowly departed. They would not return until the next morning. As the darkness grew, the forest came to life. Creatures cried out, lonely sounds, angry sounds. To David they meant nothing. All he knew was Mommy was gone, and he must find a way back to her. Animals that scavenged under cover of darkness, busy snuffling things, nose their way past him. He is not food. He is not danger. He is not even alive. Not on the outside, anyway. He is Mecca now. Before tonight he might have been a boy. His mother might have loved him. But tonight that illusion came to a crashing close. He wanders alone now, a sad little figure roaming the dark wilderness, with a toy teddy bear struggling to keep up beside him. He has not cried in some time. He stopped, actually, after Mommy's car sped from the forest and out of his life. The crying is, after all, a programmed device. After some time, his logic takes over. He knows that he cannot follow her. She said that they would destroy him. David knows destroy. He does not know they. But that does not matter now. He knows that she would not take him back even if he did find a way home. All this his creators would have expected his advanced logic to tell him. But there is a piece of reasoning that comes from some place new in his head. It comes from the same place where Mommy's eternal image burns inside. It is something not quite planned or expected. If I'm a real boy, then I can go back, and she'll love me then. David spoke this to Teddy as they coursed slowly through the dark forest. Teddy filtered this through his own old-fashioned reasoning device as he struggled through the brush and over the moss-covered ground. How, is what he finally said, when he could make no sense of David's idea. David was quiet for a time as he thought of a response. Something flitted by him then, some flying thing. It zipped quickly to and fro in the darkness. It would have gone undetected by Orga eyes and ears. His night eyes traced its progress until he could see it no more. These living things, he wondered. What was it they pursued? If he could only understand, then maybe. The blue fairy made Pinocchio into a real boy, he said to Teddy. She can make me into a real boy, too. I will find her. I will become real. This logic sounded reasonable enough to the toy bear. Where is the blue fairy? he said. I don't know, David replied. But there must be someone somewhere in the whole world who knows where she lives. This piece of reasoning sounded good to both of them, though for different reasons. Teddy because it was consistent. David because his new mind was already engaging in that all-too-human trait of self-defensive reasoning. He simply had to find the Blue Fairy. If he did not find her, then he could never be a real boy. If he could not be a real boy, then Mommy would never... His mind wouldn't finish that thought. They continued quietly for some time. Occasionally there would be the sound of clanking metal in the brush beyond, but neither of them saw whatever might be causing the sound. It did not matter anyway. David was more concerned with figuring out a way to find the Blue Fairy. How on earth would he go about this search? He'd never even been away from Mommy's house since he'd been... born? Should he just approach people and ask if they knew? Mommy had told him to stay away from Orga, that only Mecca was safe. But what if the Blue Fairy was Orga? What then? Would it be safe to approach her? 
he realized that this was going to be a complicated task. Then he saw the light. It was just a dim glow at first, growing against the leaves of the trees and bushes. Then it became brighter, casting shadows about them. And something else was happening, a sound. Some new growl had started low in the dark. It grew slowly with the light, describing some unknown menace. What manner of animal could this sound announce? An orga child would have been terrified, would have fled in fright. But the night animals have shown no taste for Mecca, so David only became curious. The sound grew in intensity. It was coming closer. Teddy had noticed it, too. And then finally, they saw the thing. The dead of the forest is home to the decaying remnants of what was once the outskirts of a glorious civilization. Shanties and ghost towns line the long, empty roads, places the Swintons and their peers would never acknowledge or even know about. Those buildings are not empty, though. They are alive with small societies of forgotten people trying to eke out an existence on the meager subsistence the forest allows. They construct their own lives out here, away from the laws and hypocrisies of the mainstream of America, or what remains of America. They are undesired and undesiring of the way of life that has been denied them. Nor are they alone, these orga who occupy the broken halls of fallen townships. There are others. They roam the forest, too. They were there that night. They had seen him earlier, this little one wandering aimlessly with his toy. He was Orga, wasn't he? Certainly he must be, from the look of him. Was he lost? Where were his mother and father? Certainly he was too young to be alone in the forest, and the toy was obviously insufficient to protect him against the threats that faced little boys in the wild. It was all too well known how the Orga cherished their children being allowed so few. Perhaps he was an illegal child. Many of the parents of unsanctioned children fled with their offspring from the new cities and centers of commerce. This was all possible, yes, but the watchers did not speak to the little one or follow him. There would have been nothing to say. So they watched him pass and went about their own business. Occasionally one of them would make a noise while moving or perhaps a piece of one of their bodies would fall off and clunk to the ground. But the little one and its toy did not seem to notice, or not to care. The forest was safe. It was well away from the centers of Orga population, so they could stay here, safe from detection, which could lead to destruction. But here there were no replacements for broken limbs, missing eyes, or malfunctioning ears. Old batteries were running low. There were those among them that had been built before the self-lubricating joints and epidermal coatings had become commonplace. They needed oils. They needed flesh. Some required a faceplate and even legs with which to run, because that is what their existence had become, a constant flight, a flight for survival. In the dead of the forest, they too heard the moan of some night beast approaching. Fascinated, they gathered from their dark hiding places to see what it was, and they too witnessed its arrival. "'What is it, David?' Teddy said to the boy, who was taller and could see easily over the brush. But David did not know. It was the source of the light, though. Its lights penetrated the gloom, and the shadows it cast grew against the trees behind them. It came closer getting louder until at last it stopped just meters away from where they were standing. This was no beast. It was a vehicle of some kind. In the light, David could now see that there was a pathway of worn earth that the thing rode on, and before it lay a shallow pit. Then, as they watched, the back end of the vehicle began to rise slowly, and things began to crash down from the mouth of it. Was this garbage? Was this where the garbage from the Orga houses was left? Somehow it did not seem a right place for it. 
The pile grew noisily. A glittering metallic din filled the forest as the vehicle emptied its belly. When it was finally done, the thing started to back away, its groaning engine complaining as the gears changed. It had moved back some distance when David and Teddy stepped out from the trees to observe the contents of the pit. There were arms in there. There were legs in there, too. And faces. Faces. Wires wound through the mess-like veins. What was this? David wondered. Then, as if in answer, they arrived. They came from the forest quickly, leaving the safety of their hiding places, running and jumping into the pile of metal debris. Some of their old and deteriorating bodies were whirring and clanking as they ran to beat the others to the treasure. Some of them weren't designed to run, so they lumbered to the pile, resentful of their better-designed companions. A few of them dragged themselves with worn and rusted arms. There were those who had been intentionally damaged by wandering orga boys with nothing better to do. There were those who had been discarded after being damaged in the line of duty to some ungrateful master. One had even been left here after saving an orga girl child from a fire. Its one reward had been to escape the salvage pit and roam the wilderness, damaged beyond use. They were the new slaves of mankind, those designed and built specific to fill the niche in humanity that humans did not anymore. They were Mecha, the robot class, custom-built and disposable. None of them noticed the small orga-like boy and his furry friend watching the struggle for parts in the pit. Nor did they notice the other one who had followed them. He was slim and quick-footed, his features handsome and smooth. He needed nothing from the pit. Joe's trek had been halting and slow. He'd had to stop and hide every time he saw Orga cruisers moving through the street. Many of the drivers had been drunk and yelling about the flesh fair. Joe was not completely aware of this fair. He'd heard tell of it, but was not sure what manner of Orga festival it might be. It did not seem like a thing for Mecca. In his flight, he'd seen a group of young Orga jump from a cruiser and topple an old silver robot that had been replacing broken street lamps near the outskirts of the city. The laughing boys had kicked the fallen robot and broken bottles against its cowering, dented body before jumping into their cruisers and fleeing. Joe did not go to assist. This looked like trouble, bad trouble. He had bad enough trouble of his own. Check that. Time to go. He'd fled into the dark as the fallen Mecca's alarm went off to alert its owners of a problem. Eventually he'd made his way out of the populated areas. Around him now was dense forest and wild things that screeched in the night. He'd heard tell of a place where runaway and discarded Mecca roamed freely, a place where desperate and diseased Orga occupied old deserted towns. Illegal children and criminals supposedly hid there too. He would find this place, perhaps one there one programmed to be smarter, would know what he should do. As he climbed an incline, Joe had seen lights moving slowly through the forest below. In the distance, he saw the moon rising slowly. Joe had watched it a moment and thought there was something strange in its ascent, but he turned when the thing in the forest took his attention. He saw the vehicle make its way into a clearing near a pit and then dispose of some litter. Then he saw them, the Mecca, the ruined leftovers of his own simple predecessors. He had seen ones like this before. The sight would savage his heart, had he such a thing. They were the derelicts, the abused and rejected, the ones whose only purpose in life had been to serve ungrateful and arrogant masters, masters who cared not for them, who discarded them not because it was more merciful than salvage, but because it was cheaper easier. Just dump the old Mecca beside the road. Go on now. We've no use for you any more. And what was their offense? Had something been broken? Some programmed gesture taken for an insult? The image of Samantha Bevan's murdering husband came into his mind. Joe was not programmed to think deeply. 
But somehow he knew that he was one of them now, that he belonged here. Gigolo Joe, what do you know? That you got no place to go? Very dismal, very dark. But what was that orga boy doing among them? Come away, David, Teddy warned. He didn't like this place. It was wrong. But David ignored him, as all boys tend to ignore the rational call to safety. The Mecca boy stood at the lip of the pit, lost in the spectacle. One man had no jaw. He took one from the pile. It did not fit. So he took another from the face of a dead woman. It clicked right into place. Another man, in an odd-looking white hat that mushroomed at the top, was burnt apparently in half. His metal skeleton had been blackened by the flame. He rummaged through the pile and searched for something that he could not seem to find. A woman with wide mechanical eyes and a glossy lopsided face knelt with her hands deep into the debris. David wondered what she was looking for. He saw a dark-skinned man pull a hand from the pile. The man was wearing a coat like the men that had come from Cybertronics to fix him. The dark man placed the hand against his arm, where his own hand should have been, but the magnetic mate-seeking wires from the hand flared and moved away from the opening. The man picked up another and placed it at his arm. This time the wires took and nestled themselves into the opening there. The flesh of the hand was light. The flesh of the man was dark. Both were worn and wrecked. Together they could function newly. David remembered this. Eventually he would understand it. The man with the new hand suddenly looked up at something on the hillside. Then all the Mecca looked up. David followed their gaze. He saw another man standing there watching them. He was dressed very nicely, like the way Henry dressed when he had taken Mommy to the ball. Was he Orga? What was he doing here? Suddenly, from behind the solitary figure, the moon appeared. Its glow was intense, and it rose quickly, too quickly. Its light filled the forest with an eerie silver glow. The Mecca gazed up silently. Moon on the rise! The man with the new hand shouted, and the Mecca in the pit leapt suddenly into action, dashing into the shadows created by the light from above back into the sanctuary of trees and forgotten shanties. David looked up at the moon and finally saw that it was wrong. The moon was too big. It had a light on the bottom and a cage below that. A cage. And there were men. No, not men. There were Mecca in the cage. This was no moon. David turned to watch the fleeing robots anxiously, unsure what was going on. One of them who had dragged himself here was picked up by another and was being hoisted out of the pit. He looked at David as he was being rescued by his fellow refugees. This was no Orga boy, he realized. It was one of them. It's the Flash Fair, the man explained quickly in a gruff voice. They destroy us on stage. I know, I've been there, he said, pointing to the place where his legs should have been. Then he was gone, hustled off by his mechanical comrade. David was watching the spectacle in confusion. Destroy us on stage. David knew destroy. What do we do? He said to anyone near. We run now, Teddy advised. And they did. The wet and mossy floor of the forest was slippery underneath them as the light of the moon grew, trying to envelop them and deny their escape. Any old iron! The voice from the moon called out. The sound reverberated through the forest below and out over the hills that led to Barn Creek. Spotlights burnt down from the false moon, forcing their way into the density of trees and brush. Things were moving in there, the things that had come for the goodies his men had left out. Any old iron! The voice queried again. The accent was not from around these parts. Those Zorga who lived in the forest puzzled at the sound. Was it a Brit? An Aussie? But some of them already knew that voice. Expel your Mecca! 
the voice demanded. Purge yourselves of artificiality, it insisted, commanding. The man behind the voice scanned the ground beneath him. There were things moving, but were they Mecca? These woods were full of old hovels where the victims of the modern age made their makeshift homes. Come along now, he bellowed into the microphone from his throne in the metal basket of the moon balloon. On the banister of the basket, an array of equipment was analyzing the dark forest below. Scanners, spotlights, monitors. Young uniformed men manned these instruments. Let some of the mecha loose to run! Any old unlicensed iron will do. He knew the poor ones kept the old discards for working and doing chores and what not. But orga hands were designed for that. God had made him that way. And if it was good enough for God... Below him the forest bristled here and there. Not much, it seemed. Not enough for sure. This was not a good thing, not a good thing at all. He had a show to put on tonight. More than a show. It was a mission. A calling. It was a good old-time revival. Time that Orga got some good old rejuvenation. Enough of the simulation. Hey, see that? The man behind the voice pointed down at a clearing of trees, where the beam of light fell upon some moving figures. One of his men aimed the spotlight in that direction. Ah, there we are, the man said. He tipped back his large black hat. A thin smile broke on his rugged face. They had already bagged a couple of strays and had them in the cage. This night might turn out to be okay, after all. What's that over there? the man said, pointing. There was a man running beneath them. He looked odd in the forest, dressed with some flamboyance, as if to a dinner party. Is that a human thing? the man said. His aide checked the scanner. Nah, he's running cold. No expiration date, no ID, but he looks like late generation lover mecca, the aide responded. Well, that would be a relief from all this antique iron, the black-hatted man thought. But what would a new model be doing loose and unregistered? He'd been at this mission for years now, and knew the ropes. He smelled trouble. You're certain he's not a man? I wouldn't want to repeat of the Trenton incident, he said, grimacing at the memory. The Ed turned to face him. Sir, it's a free-range mecca, running hot, he said. Good enough. Let's reel him in, boys, he grunted, fastening the command console to the saddle before him. Sick the hounds on the rest, he ordered. The floating moon balloon was a sudden flurry of activity as the men went to their duties. There was a good catch down there, and they had a big show to put on. David was moving faster than he'd ever had to before. He wasn't good at the running. It required certain motion capabilities with which he was inadequately equipped. He didn't know this, of course. He only knew that he had to slow down to turn corners and focus on where he was going before he could change direction. He was not tired. David did not get tired like Orga, but he was confused. What was happening? Why were they running, and where were they running to? Behind him, David could hear the man in the sky yelling. Let them loose now! Come on! Let the mecha run! The man's voice echoed through the forest penetrating into the dark corners of safety the Mecca sought out. Who was he talking to, David wondered. David! David! David stopped and turned to see Teddy's furry head just above the line of brush as he struggled to catch up. I cannot run as fast as you, David, Teddy explained logically when he caught up to the boy. You must carry me, the bear said. David lifted Teddy in a tight embrace and then started to run again, catching up to the herd of fleeing Mecca as they were stampeded towards a trap. Her keepers called her Robot because she didn't have a name. She only had a function. Built specific to that function, she had outlived her usefulness and had been abandoned here with the others. She could not hide her mecha nature like Joe or David, for although her face was human-like and tenderness was written into its every feature, 
Her metal infrastructure had punched through her skin in places, and the crown of her head had been knocked off ages ago when she had fallen from a transport van. As time wore on and the oils and devices she needed for repair had been unavailable, she had deteriorated. Her arms, defleshed by time and disrepair, had become mere robotic bones, her frame a mass of metal joints and pulleys covered by a thin brittle layer of skin. Only her faceplate, in its fixed expression of gentle concern, displayed her true programmed nature. She was discarded property, nothing more. Then they had taken her in, her keepers, those who lived among the trees and forgotten dwellings that lined the abandoned trails, once busy thoroughfares. They were another family of discarded beings, these Orga. She had cared for their unlicensed children. She had prepared what meager foodstuffs the adults brought home from scavenging or hunting or occasionally shopping with the small amount of money those healthy enough to work could secure. She had nurtured and trained and scolded all the little ones of the shanty while the adults fought the daily battle of survival. But in the end, she was still just property, just Mecca. When the voice had boomed down from the sky, her orga keepers had gazed up in fear. It was a foreign voice. Was it the Federals, bounty hunters? No, one of them pointed out. It's the flesh fair. Perhaps it was time to let her go. Once again, she had outlived her usefulness. The little ones clung to her aging, deteriorating frame, but were forced loose by anxious adults. Run, robot, they told her as the little ones cried. Run! Joe ran as fast as he could, navigating the thickly brushed forest floor with great difficulty, his legs whirring in their frenzy. Behind him the man's voice boomed out strange things. He talked about artificiality and simulators. Was he referring to the rejects? To Joe it all sounded like bad trouble. He followed the trail of the abandoned robots. They lived out here, so he assumed they'd know where they were going. But the mecha had scattered in all directions. Which to follow? Check that. Modify approach indeed. He had the sudden idea to stop and see where the moon thing was going. He would run in the opposite direction. But when he turned around, what he saw was an object flying from the bottom of the craft. It was hissing through the air as it sped in his direction. Then he was enveloped in it. The hounds were waiting in the brush. Their breath was calm, their posture bent, prepared for the chase. They'd been through this hundreds of times in the remote hiding places of Mecca throughout the world. As usual, it was quiet at first. Only the boss's voice could be heard in the distance, booming from the black sky. The moon balloon was corralling the hapless Mecca right towards them. Worked every time. It would take a few minutes to get the robots headed in the right direction, but the hounds were patient. They were ready. They'd been trained for this. They had nets and magna tags for the hunt. When they heard the crash of robot feet trampling through the brush, they started their engines. David stopped at a clearing with the fleeing herd. There were strange things in the trees before them, things that hummed low, feral, metallic snarls. They were lit up in an assortment of colors and flashing lights. In the midst of these lights, there were formed the faces of wolves with bared fangs and wildfire behind their eyes. But above them, the helmeted heads of organ men were plainly visible until the headlights came on. The hound's engines roared as their wheels threw dirt and mud in an arc behind them. The mecha turned and ran. They quickly passed the little organ-like mecha and his super toy. It was to each his own now. Shake down shantytown! The man in the black hat yelled when he saw the hounds start the chase. He knew where the mecha would go. The orga and the shanties would be hiding inside by now. These types were easily cowed by such displays of power. He knew that all too well. 
and the chase was on. Shacks were raided. The hounds knocked over flimsy dwellings in their pursuit, heedless of whether Orga or Mecca made their home there. This was a holy mission. Could sort them out later. They pursued their prey through the rusted remains of old passenger trains that had been derailed and turned into makeshift dwellings. The wolf heads at the front of the cycle spat magnetic tags from their mouths. The tags attached to the mecha and then secured them to any metallic surface nearby. The sides of the trains now sported struggling mecha as the chase sped by. The night became filled with the electronic whine of the hound's engines and the sounds of magnet tags hitting their mark. Soon the cries of angry orga were added to the violent sounds of the hunt. David had managed to run in a different direction, away from the frenzied escapees that drew the hounds into the shanty town. He could hear the hounds' snarling engines going in the opposite direction. But where should he run? Where could he hide? He scanned the darkness with his night eyes. There was an old dark shack near a gathering of trees. Sanctuary. He ran quickly, carrying Teddy with him through an overgrown field and up the creaking stairs that led into the old building. Inside the shack the sound of the chase was diminished to a hollow reverberation against the walls. He heard one of the cycles passing close by. Had they seen him come in here? He backed away from the door and the sound of terror outside. He didn't want to be here. He wanted to be home with Mommy where he could be safe. He wanted to hear her voice reading stories to him and to be tucked into his... David bumped into something behind him and turned quickly. He saw a woman standing there. No, he realized. She was not a woman. Her head was opened at the top and her arms were like bones. But her face was kind and understanding, the kind of face a child would never fear. And there were others beside her, strange-looking Mecca. One was a large metal cylinder with a head and face protruding from its side. The face was sad and old. The others were beaten, dented robots, shadows of their original selves, huddled together in the dark room. Then Annie was surprised to see an orga boy here. What's your name, little boy? she said. My name is David, David replied. Hello, David, the nanny said cheerfully. How old are you? Her voice was calm and calming. David found himself ignoring the sounds of the chase outside as he spoke with her, but he did not know the answer to that question. It was from the before time. I don't know, he said finally. The nanny knelt down to the poor, frightened child. She could not feel the way he could. She was built long before the idea of a sentient robot like David was even considered possible. But she was programmed to calm the little ones. Do you need someone to take care of you? She said. I have many good references. References? David knew references. References come from experiences. Had she been many places? If she had been many places, then maybe... Do you know where the Blue Fairy lives? He said excitedly. Then, with a crash and a flash of feral lights, the real world found them. Its glowing fangs and roaring engines smashed through the walls of the shack. David was reduced again to a frightened child. He turned and backed up to the nanny, who wrapped her remaining arm protectively around him. The hound hesitated before he shot the net. There was an orga boy hiding with the bots. What the hell was this kid doing running with the fiber heads? Maybe the brat wasn't illegal and thought the hounds were kid catchers. He didn't want an orga in the net, especially not a kid. He was sure that the boss would chew him out on that one. But if he waited to shoot, they'd all scatter. So he triggered the handle and shot the net. It hissed through the shack and fell over the trapped mecha, wrapping him up tightly. He'd let the kid loose later, he thought, but definitely before the boss sees him. Illegals weren't his business anyway. David watched helplessly, stunned as the hounds swarmed into the hut. They smashed right through the wall, sending dust and shards of wood everywhere. The men crawled off their cycles and yanked the net until it came out of the hole they created. The noise, the pushing and the punching, as they were pulled from their hiding space, was something David had never experienced. Were they going to destroy him now? Inside his head a memory of Mommy's tender touch 
took him away from the madness of the moment. Why did you leave me? He thought. Why? The Mecca were dragged outside into an overgrown field. They were laid into the dirt, and the men who had captured them crawled off their cycles. Others chased more running Mecca. The noise of their engines and yelling faded into the darkness with them. One of the riders walked to where David lay, tangled in the net with the others. His face was covered in the helmet, and his voice was crusty and mean. Kid, what in the hell are you doing running with the dang bots? he said. But then the man stopped and eyed David carefully. This kid looked too well fed to be a vagrant. His clothes were way too clean. Had they captured some upper crust kid in the net? There were plenty of gated towns around. Damn, the man thought. Johnson was always bringing up Trenton in the lawsuits. This could put him out of a job. Hey, come and help me get this brat out of here, the man yelled as he began untwisting the folds of the net. He freed Teddy first and tossed the super to his side. But Teddy jumped up quickly and ran back at the man, growling and commanding him to stop what he was doing. This made the man laugh. His little girl had one of those things, probably somewhere in the closet now, with all the other toys she had gotten tired of. He grabbed Teddy up by the scruff of the neck while he tried to free the boy with his other hand. Another man was approaching. Did you scan him? he said. This one's skin, the first man replied. He's got a teddy, too. Take a look for yourself. Scan him, the other man ordered, annoyed. Always scan him. Johnson will have your ass if you let him mecha loose tonight. The man who was helping David stopped and muttered something angry that David couldn't hear. Why are you doing this? David said, innocently. Shut up, kid, the man replied. Teddy growled as the man placed a small metal device against David's head. The man was quiet for a moment while he read the meter. Then he made a gasping sound. Damn, the man said. What's wrong, said the other man, running quickly to his side. Damnedest thing I've ever seen, the man said in disbelief. The other riders were walking over now, gazing down at the boy in the net. David could not see their faces through their masks but he heard the grunts and whistling sounds. Johnson ain't gonna believe this one, one of them said. David did not understand what the men wanted. One of them had pulled on his face. There was pain in his touch. Was this part of destroying him? The nanny freed her arm from the tangle of Mecca and the net and wrapped David up protectively. She began to whisper softly into his ear. It's okay, the bad men will go away. Don't be afraid, David. David pressed himself back against her, away from these rough men. She was not Mommy, but she was all he had now. Ain't that sweet, one of the men laughed. You're going to be one hell of a show, little Mecca. Hope you enjoy your moment in the spotlight, however short it is. The moon balloon was coming now, its light growing on the ground around them. The metal cage dangling beneath it was already filled with other Mecca. The men started struggling with the net, and David understood that they were going to take them all away in the balloon. He called out for Teddy. He simply couldn't leave without his friend. The man who had taken Teddy held the toy up for David to see. You want this, Mecca? he said. David nodded. Yes, please, he said politely. Why? the man snorted. He's my friend, David explained. The man in the helmet seemed to consider this for a moment. He didn't know why the hell someone would build a little kid robot in the first place. But then he shrugged. Hell, I ain't gonna do you no good anyway. Here, he said, as he pressed Teddy against the net. David took hold of the toy bear and then felt himself being lifted up into the night sky. Below, he could see the trees receding into the darkness as the men mounted their hounds and rode off and he could see other nets of Mecca being readied for hoisting. Orga were down there, too, haggard, hungry-looking faces. They stood passively by, watching the spectacle. They were used to being powerless, used to being abused. The nanny could sense David's fear, and she began to sing to him. David did not know lullaby, and he did not know French, but the song calmed him all the same. 
He was holding Teddy tightly through the net as the forest shrunk into the darkness below. But suddenly he felt Teddy slip. Teddy felt David's hand losing its grip. The little bear knew the distance to the ground beneath was far, more than his body would be able to take. David, I will break, he said. But even as he said this, he saw that the little mecca could not get a grip on his furry paw. Teddy had no emotions like David. None of the mecca in the net did. But Teddy knew goodbye. He took one last look at the boy who was his friend in charge as he struggled not to lose his failing grip. Some new sensation played inside his processor, a flash of something new and bright. He saw it just for an instant, and then he was airborne, falling through the darkness. He watched the balloon and his young friend recede into the night sky. The air rushed by his ears as he fell. Then he felt a crash of tree branches, and there was darkness. David watched in shock as his little friend fell into the black below. His mind was freshly assaulted by the sensation of loss, this dark feeling that the men and women of Cybertronics had not considered in their calculations. He was alone now, utterly alone. Mommy had left him in the damp, forbidding forest. The same brutal forest had just swallowed Teddy as he'd watched helplessly from above. His mind became confused and lost. Why was this happening? He struggled to understand, but the pain in his head was not calculable. The nanny held him tightly as she sang, but this no longer consoled his tender new emotions. Teddy! he called out, but the forest was silent beneath them. Teddy was gone. The pain inside was a hard, unforgiving thing. David laid back into the net, and the nanny coddled and caressed him to no avail. In the distance he heard the sound of thunder and metal, the sound of people yelling and screaming. He heard a chant arise in that scream, an unsettling chant. This was the place where the moon bloom was slowly heading. It was a place where Mecca provided another service for grim orga appetites. The night lit slowly as they moved closer to the noise. The lights were yellow, then blue, then red, gyrating violently, faster and faster. Rockets went off in the sky. The multicolored trails of their explosions arced and fell around the cage to Mecca, embracing them, welcoming special guests to the ritual, the sacrifice to the callous orga gods of anger and fear. Among the condemned, a new robot, a little boy of their kind, struggled with a sadness and desperation the rest would never know.